In the days of David's son, Solomon, Jerusalem was raised to a higher level. Solomon organized the kingdom, and therefore also the capital city, better. Solomon built a greater royal palace in Jerusalem with a more formidable throne of judgment. And most importantly, Solomon had erected the glorious temple for the Ark of the Covenant with the Holy of, in the Holy of Holies. David, up another level to Solomon, and then up another level, not just a small one between David and Solomon, but a major one. Because in the New Testament, with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, including his crucifixion and glorification, Jerusalem is now in heaven, not merely on earth. Jerusalem is Catholic. Jerusalem is in many places all around the globe, and not just merely in one place. And now too, Christ is in Jerusalem, personally, by his Holy Spirit, in each individual, instituted, true Christian church, by his Holy Spirit, and not merely there as he was in Old Testament, by type and shadow. The next and final development in Jerusalem comes at the end of the world, when everywhere in heaven and on earth will be Jerusalem, the holy city, and as Revelation puts it, nothing that defiles it shall ever enter in. Jerusalem's membership will be 100% regenerate and sanctified. But we're not there yet. <coughs> Although it's drawing nearer all the time. So we're going to glean from Psalm 122 several key principles concerning our pilgrimage to <laughs> Jerusalem. Or, to state it more prosaically, how we go to public worship or church, so to speak, on the Lord's Day. And this, I remind you again, particularly in light of the Lord's Supper next Sabbath morning. Consider then the right way to go to church. The right way to go to church. First, going with the right attitude. Second, going for the right reasons. And third, going with the right prayer. The right way to go to church, as this applies to our attitude, our reasons for going, and the prayer with which we go. Now there's one word in Psalm 122 which encapsulates the right approach, the right attitude, the right mindset for public worship. And that one word is glad. That's what it says. <coughs> Verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad. And the Hebrew word rendered glad here means smiling, cheerful, and merry of countenance. Some of you may remember there was a sermon not that long ago which contained this same word. Smiling, merry, and cheerful of countenance. And this being a Hebrew word in the Old Testament, the idea is that the external is a reflection of the internal. The internal being the more important thing because God looks on the heart. So that the heart is joyful, peaceful, happy, satisfied, <coughs> glad. So how did we score in this regard this morning? Did we have our children? And this is often the way, especially with smaller children, because they struggle with these things. Why can't I, Mum, just have a lie-in this morning? Do I have to go? And you can understand that attitude, of course, from children because they're childish. They think as a child, they reason as a child. But what about our attitude coming here tonight? 
What about older children? I went this morning. Surely once is enough. Or, well, I suppose it's time, right? Let's get in the car. Time to go. If that's your attitude, then it's no wonder that you're not prospering as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's no wonder, assuming that to be the sort of standard or level or zeal of your Christian life, then if that's the case, then you do little witnessing or church work. It's no wonder you don't bring anybody to the church because you don't really have any great hunger or interest in the word yourself. And that being the case, you're hardly going to bother or put yourself out much to try and stir up anybody else. So why then did you come here tonight? Let us all examine ourselves here. Because this is the key idea of the first part of the Lord's Supper form. Self-examination. What about habit? I came to church tonight because it is my habit. Well, that's a good habit. Human beings are creatures of habit. There are good habits, and as we know, there are bad habits. Sometimes, it's all that we can do to just go out of habit. That's all we can muster. And if that's all you can muster, go to church nonetheless, confess that sin, and seek more grace to do it with a better attitude next time. But do go to church. Because you don't say, well, I haven't a perfect attitude here, and so I'll just break the commandment completely. No, you do the best you can. Because if we couldn't do a Christian work, Unless we were 100% of the right attitude, then we would never do anything. What about custom? I came to church because it's my custom. Well, it's a good custom. Jesus Christ, we read in Luke 4, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. But we need a bit more than that. What about duty? And it is a duty to come to church. It's a moral imperative. Because it's one of the Ten Commandments. Not just the Ten Suggestions or the Nine Commandments. Ten. It goes right along with, Thou shalt not kill. Or, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's a commandment. That's a duty. But what about joy and gladness? Building upon these things, custom, duty, flowing out of these things as we grow in grace, and then to joy, cheerfulness, as regards the Lord's Supper next Sunday morning. Now let's notice a few things about this joy or gladness from our passage. This is definitely a personal joy. The psalmist David, the man after God's own heart, this is to be according to God's own heart, says this, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And this is what the office bearer should say. I was glad when they said unto me. And this is what the father should say, and the wives, I was glad. I personally, gladness and joy. The young people should say, and even as our children grew up in the faith, the small ones. This is the way it should be with us today in both of our services, with each one of us individually and all of us glad. 